Okay. Okay. Listen up. We need to talk. Chemistry? We need to talk. What are these geometries, chemistry? What are these bond angles? Well, I am on a quest today, ladies and gentlemen. I will try to do my best to do what your textbooks will not do. Explain where these angles and shapes are even coming from. Okay. okay. I, I'm just going to get to the point. The title. Why 109.5? Why so many random angles? Okay. So firstly, what am I even talking about? For people who never took chemistry in high school or after 10th grade, this all may seem like nonsense. What is a bond angle even? Well, let us start from the beginning. As a famous person once said, let us start from the top. Let us revisit bonds once. There is nothing that atoms love more than stability and there are many ways to attain this stability. The main way is to form bonds with other atoms by losing electrons, shedding electrons and more. These bonds exist between atoms as a way for all of them to be relatively stable. Of course, if another rearrangement would make an atom more stable, it will just change its bonds to attain more stability. But that is the gist of how bonds work. Now metals and ionic compounds tend to be pretty regular and form lattices. In case you have forgotten, ionic bonds are when a metal and a non-metal bond with the metal losing its electron to the non-metal. This causes both to develop opposite charges and attract each other. Metals and ionic compounds love being normal. They form lattices, which are 3D structures where cations, positive metal ions, and anions, in the case of ionic compounds, alternate regularly. For metals, it's just cations and delocalized electrons. Covalent compounds, on the other hand, are much stranger. Covalent compounds have various geometries and structures that they form when bonding. Covalent compounds are the result of covalent bonds. This is the force of attraction between nuclei and the pair of electrons they share. Well, these compounds like to form various structures, covalent structures, with specific shapes when they bond together. And to understand this concept, we first need to understand something I just said. What is electron sharing? Well, there are two types of electron pairs and a covalent bond. Bond pairs and lone pairs. Electrons, being of the same charge, tend to repel each other. As you'll remember from school, like charges repel each other. The bond pairs are the electron pairs that form the covalent bond, while the lone pairs are the electron pairs in the central atom that are not used for bonding. This is the general idea. For the sake of simplicity, we'll be taking compounds with only bond pairs. However, when there are lone pairs, they tend to increase electron repulsion, thus the bond angles will just typically decrease. However, that will overcomplicate our focus a little. And by a little, I mean a lot. So we'll only focus on bond pairs for now. The idea of a central atom is very important. So now different atoms have different levels of electronegativities, which is how much they pull on an electron pair. Typically, the atom with the least electronegativity is the central atom, as its electrons are pulled away towards the other atom. Now there are many kinds of bonds that can form and each bond and lone pair that forms is called an electron domain. We will be focusing up to 6 electron domains as the geometry gets a bit crazy after that. And by a bit crazy I mean that I do not comprehend it fully myself yet. And those compounds are also extremely rare. However, if you wish to see 7, 8 and 9 electron domains, please like the video. And if you don't want that to happen, still like the video. If you do want that to happen, you can just comment. Let us start with 4 electron domains. A common example is methane, a simple carbon surrounded by 4 hydrogens, all single bonds. There are no lone pairs in this compound. Now the bond angle in this case is 109.5 degrees. And when I first heard that, I could not comprehend this. Absolutely no sense on first sight. However, it is actually quite elegant. And to understand it, you need to strip your focus away from the 2D plane and into the 3D one. In the end, we need to realize molecules exist in three dimensions, and thus three-dimensional geometry is the best way to understand these structures. Now, I actually used Wikipedia to understand it, but I'll explain it to you the best I can. Imagine the 3D plane with origin 0, 0, 0. Now, we can make that on a handy tool we call GeoGebra. Now, let us imagine the central atom, carbon, sitting at the origin. And now, let us imagine four hydrogen atoms. All hydrogen atoms are an equal distance away from the carbon and thus we can take up points with a unit difference in each direction. This gives us the points negative 1, 1, negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1, 1, and 1, 1, negative 1. We can put this on GeoGebra as well. Now, if you think these points were taken arbitrarily, they kind of were, but you can also just rotate the structure around the origin and the bond angles will stay the same. You can really dilate or rotate the structure as you like. Now we can find the bond angle between two of these bonds. To do that, we can make a line segment between each carbon hydrogen bond. Now when I make this structure in GeoGebra, you realize it is the optimal shape that bonds can take. All hydrogens are as far away from each other as possible. It is 
brilliant. We can now use dot products and vectors to find the bond angle. However, if you want to explore that, you can just see the Wikipedia or the dot product itself. I'll link it in the description if you want to research more about that. In this case, in this case, GeoGebra has a handy angle tool which you can use. And would you look at that? 109.47 degrees which is approximately 109.5 degrees. It is the same for all of them too. This result amazed me. We took a number that we are told about in high school, a bond angle. We took that and showed it to be true using geometry. And I think that is brilliant. However, let us not just stop there. Let us move on to trigonal bipyramidal structures. That is a mouthful to say every single time. This in summary is just five electron domains but in reality, they're just two structures within one. There is a trigonal planar on one pair of axis and a linear bond on the other. Now, in case you're wondering what those are, a trigonal planar has three electron domains and a linear has two. And three plus two is five. That's how we get the five electron domains. Now, these axes have to be perpendicular to each other. Otherwise, there is too much inter-electron repulsion. So, we will now be using geometry to show why there are three bond angles. 90 degrees, 120 degrees, and 180 degrees. Let us use the example of PCL5, phosphorus pentachloride. Phosphorus is the central atom here. So let us use the same tool and plot it at the origin. Now let us plot the linear bond. One chlorine at 0, 0, 001 and the other at 0, 0, minus 001. You can see the two chlorines form a perfect linear bond. Now this makes sense. Now let us plot our trigonal planner on the perpendicular pair of axis. Since we plotted the linear bond on the x and z axis, let us use the x and y axis for the trigonal planner. Now to make this easier, let us plot one point, 0 and 0, and then rotate it around the z axis by 120 degrees, once clockwise and once counterclockwise. This is because we already know the bond angle of a trigonal planner is 120 degrees because it is optimal. And you will notice that this shape is perfectly optimal. Once again, we have a perfectly optimal structure with all electrons as far away from each other as possible. The plane with the trigonal planner is called the equatorial plane. As Ken mentioned, the linear bonds are called axial bonds and the trigonal planar bonds are called equatorial bonds as they are on the equatorial plane. Now using the angle tool again, we see three bond angles. Now the diagram gets a bit messy, but we can see there's a 180 degree bond angle between the two chlorine atoms Cl and Cl2, 120 degree bonds between Cl5, Cl4 and Cl3 and a perpendicular 90 degree bond between the two planes. This forms the three bond angles that we see in a trigonal bipyramidal geometry. Lastly, there is the easiest, which is six electron domains, also called octahedral. It is also the easiest to say. Let us take the example of SF6 or sulfur hexafluoride. This is just three perpendicular linear bonds, which we can plot on perpendicular axis. So let us plot sulfur at the origin. We can take one pair of points, 100 and negative 100. Another one is 010 and 0, negative 10. Lastly, 0, 0, 001 and 0, 0, negative 1. As you can see, the linear bonds are perpendicular. So there are 90 and 180 degree bond angles. And with that, we are done. So, that was quite a journey. What we have done here is taken something, something we consider just a fact, something to be true, and prove why it is true. And this is exactly what I love about science and math. We can take something and prove it. In this case, it's using geometry and show it to be true. Something in nature, corresponding with our geometries and symmetry. That is beautiful. And while I may have started this video rambling, and to be honest, I continue to ramble throughout certain sections of this video, I hope you can end this video realizing these disciplines, physics, chemistry, math, biology, etc. They are not desperate. They're all intertwined. Wonderful disciplines that can come together in unexpected ways to reveal truths about our world. Even if that truth is disguised as a bond angle of 109.5 degrees. Thank you for watching and please hit the like button, subscribe and click the bell icon. Thank you.